Imagine this. World War II has blanketed the planet in darkness. Good and evil fight on every front. Heroes and villains claw their way from trench to trench, leaving every foot saturated in blood and sweat. You live in the Netherlands, and Nazi Germany has dominated your nation. Their brutal rule has left cities in ruins and families tattered and broken. Children were left as orphans and starving, living on the streets and in overcrowded orphanages with nowhere else to go. You have heard rumors of a Dutch resistance group that surgically cuts through Nazi soldiers, snuffing them out in swift and decisive moves the evil enemy could not root out or predict. Among the ever-swirling rumors, one in particular has caught the imaginations of both the Dutch and Germans. Even Hitler himself has made a public declaration about it. In one story, a soulless Nazi soldier took the infant baby of a young Dutch couple in an alley. He grabbed it by the leg and swung it as hard as he could against the brick wall as the couple screamed, helpless to stop it. Like a phantom, a beautiful 17-year-old girl appeared in the alley before the Nazi could react while he was still swinging the now limp infant's body against the bricks. The teenage girl reached into her coat and shot the shocked soldier and watched him crumple to the ground. The teenage girl apologized for not getting there earlier, then left the couple to gather their baby's body and bury her. You think about this as you walk down the smoke-filled streets of your village. Two armed German soldiers strut toward you on the other side of the street, when out of the corner of your eye, you see three teenage girls riding bikes that look just like the descriptions you have heard. They ride up behind the Nazis and whip out machine guns. There are three bursts of gunfire, and the soldiers are dead before they hit the ground. The three girls hide their guns and ride hard away, disappearing into the smoke. These are all true stories of the women known as the Dutch resistance heroines. During World War II, there was a small group of them that were pivotal in helping take down the Nazis in the Netherlands. But in this episode of Vivid Crackle, we are gonna look at three in particular. The teenage female Nazi assassins are Hanny Shaft, Freddie Overstegen, and her sister, Truce Overstegen. These three young women are some of the most incredible people you will ever hear about in your entire life. All three of them killed so many Nazis, they couldn't even give the number and took it to the grave with them. When asked, their simple answer was, you never ask a soldier how many people he's killed. In May of 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. It was a fast and brutal invasion that started on May 10th, and by the 15th, the German army had conquered all of the Netherlands, and the Dutch army had surrendered. But while the army had waved a white flag, the Dutch people most certainly did not. All hands were on deck and ready to fight back. Truce Overstegen was 16 years old and her younger sister Freddie 14 when they joined the resistance. 20-year-old Hanny Shaft had joined around the same time and the three became friends. Why the lives of these three women haven't been turned into an epic Call of Duty game is beyond me. Because so many of their missions could have been ripped straight out of a first person shooter. The red hair, milky skinned Hanny Shaft's first mission was to sneak into a public pool and steal ID cards so that two of her Jewish friends wouldn't get sent to concentration camps. If that isn't a classic game level, I don't know what is. When the Nazis tried to force Dutch students to sign commitments of loyalty to the Nazi party and Hanny, along with other students, refused. They were kicked out of school and refused any further education, which was fine by them. It gave them more time for Nazi killing. She went to the resistance and asked them for weapons so she could assassinate Nazis rather than do the level one stuff of stealing documents. The resistance, without her knowing it, decided to test her. So they sent her out to assassinate a Nazi target. She didn't hesitate when she got there, but when she pulled the trigger, the gun would not fire. She pulled the trigger over and over again, but nothing happened. It was then that the resistance revealed that there was no target at all and that it was her final test, which she passed. Now, she could assassinate some Nazis for real. The Overstegans and Hanny Shaft used their beauty and youth fearlessly to their advantage. 
They would wear bright red lipstick, put on mascara, and head to local bars where Nazis and their Dutch supporters would drink. They pretended to be what were called kraut girls, which was a term for Dutch girls who pretended to have relationships with German officers. They all had a knack for starting seemingly casual conversations with these men, and Freddy, who had joined at 14 and was given her first assassination mission when she was only 16, was an even bigger draw to the soldiers because she would wear her hair in braids. Raids. The three young women would flirt their way into the confidence of the soldiers and then invite them out for a romantic walk in the woods. Of course, these soldiers had no idea that there was a group of Dutch resistance fighters waiting to turn that romantic walk into their bloody end. When asked if they ever regretted their actions, the answer was a resounding no. They said, we were dealing with cancerous tumors in society that you had to cut out like a surgeon. Because the Overstegen sisters were so young, they were especially good at innocently riding through enemy lines on their bikes, taking secret messages, or following Nazi soldiers to their homes and assassinating them. Their missions got even bigger and more dangerous as the years went by. They helped sneak Jewish refugees into hiding places and even blew up a railroad track. Not all of the missions went perfectly. One day, Truce and Hanny were assigned to kill a Dutch barber who had become a traitor. He was giving information to the Germans. However, when they rolled up on him on their bikes, Hanny tried to shoot him, but her gun jammed. Truce pulled out her gun and shot him in the head and back, but he still wasn't dead. His fiance, who saw this, started screaming, which which forced the two assassins to flee, leaving their target still alive. They rode to a nearby bar and charged inside. As soon as they entered, they said, gentlemen, your attention please. We're coming in now, but when the Germans come in, we've been here all afternoon. If you do not behave the way we want you to, and we're on our way to heaven, we will take a few of you with us. We do not intend to just give up. They then drank some alcohol so their breath would smell of it, and they could pretend to be drunk, and then they waited. When the German officers finally arrived, Truce immediately threw herself at one of them, wrapping her arms around his neck and saying in a fake, drunken voice, Hey, Heinz, come here. This was so aggressive and off-putting that the soldiers pushed her away and left, not wanting to deal with that crazy girl. On one of her latter missions, Hanny was sent to assassinate a Nazi allied police captain with her fellow resistance member, John Bonacamp. It went sideways though, and the police captain shot back before they could hit him, wounding John. Hanny managed to escape, but John was taken captive by the Nazis. Hanny was already famous, known only as the red-haired girl, whom even Hitler himself had ordered the capture of. The Nazis tried to get information on her from John, first through torture, but he refused to give them anything. Then they deceived him by sending in a Nazi member who posed as a Dutch resistance fighter. He tricked John into giving him Hanny's parents' address, and they were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Hanny fought even harder after this, but just months before the war was ended, she was stopped at a Nazi checkpoint. She had started dyeing her hair black as everyone was looking for a red-haired girl, but she didn't have time to dye it recently, and her red roots were visible. The Nazis arrested her and tortured her and took her out to some sand dunes outside Overveen village just 18 days before the Netherlands were liberated. When the Nazi executioner pulled out his gun and shot, he only wounded her at first. Before he could pull the trigger a second time, Hanny uttered her last words. Idiots, I'm a better shot. She died at the age of 24. The Nazis buried over 500 resistance soldiers in those dunes. When the war was over, the Dutch people exhumed as many bodies as they could, including Hanny's, and buried them in Overveen. The Overstegen sisters both survived the war and lived long lives, though they dealt with depression and PTSD, coping with them in different ways. Hanny Shaft was awarded a posthumous Medal of Freedom by the Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower. Truce and Freddy were both awarded the Mobilization War Cross by the Prime Minister in 2014, and Truce was honored by Yad Vashem 
and Jerusalem for the work she had done with the Jews. While their best friend Hanny didn't get to enjoy the fruits of her work like the Overstegen sisters, they made sure she was remembered as the legend she was, telling her story throughout their lives. Truce Overstegen died in 2016 at the age of 92, and Freddie died in 2018 at the same age. But their story lives on.